Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Well, good morning. It's good to see all of you. Glad you have chosen to worship at FaithBridge, whether you are in Center Court East, Center Court West, in the Woodlands, or coming to us online. It's great to have all of you with us today. Today, we are exactly two weeks away from Christmas. Now, that is a thrilling thought for some of you, perhaps a little terrifying for others of you. Whatever the case may be, we are also smack dab in the middle of the church season known as Advent. Advent. Now, the word Advent uh, means uh, it refers to an appearance, an arrival of a noted individual. And of course, in the church community, we are in looking forward to the Advent of Jesus Christ on Christmas Day. We celebrate his birth on that day, the fact that he came to earth in the flesh. Historically, the Advent season is an opportunity for the church to reflect. What actually does that mean that Jesus came? The, uh, the theological term for Jesus coming in the flesh is the incarnation. And Christians around the world are thinking about that and thinking about the significance of the incarnation for their own lives and for the church and the world at large. Today, we're going to be looking at two different stories about the advent of Jesus, one in the Gospel of Luke and one in the Gospel of John. Ushers are coming down the aisle right now. If you need a Bible, raise your hands. We'll be glad to give it to you. That uh, can be yours to keep. Please consider that an early Christmas gift from Faith Bridge. The Luke story, as found in chapter 2, is the, the more traditional story that we typically hear around Christmas time. We'll be reading that one first, beginning in verse 1. Luke chapter 2, verse 1. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them." And then from the Gospel of John, we'll be reading in chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, and then verse 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. Pray with me, please. Father, we are immensely grateful for the privilege, the freedom we have to gather in your house and remember this incredible event that your son Jesus chose to take on human flesh to make his dwelling among us. We will be eternally grateful for that. As we consider that truth and what it means for our lives and for our world, we pray that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher and guide us into all truth. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. As I was studying those passages, my mind went back in time to April 12, 1998, a day that I will never forget as long as I live, because it was on that day that I became a father. There are many aspects, experiences of that day that are indelibly etched into my memory, but there's one in particular that sort of stands out 
from all the rest. And it took place the first time that I held my daughter. The nurse placed her in my arms and I'm just you know, standing there in amazement at this miracle. And like all dads, you know, thinking to myself, surely this is the most beautiful creature God ever made. And in the midst of that very serene and blissful moment, an unbidden thought began to form in my mind. And pretty soon that thought took full shape. And the thought was this, this is for real. This is not a test. This is not a warm up. This is a real flesh and blood child that I am holding here and I am responsible for this little person here. In, in some respects, it was, it was almost overwhelming, the reality of the situation. Now, of course, I had known that this was going to happen for some time. It wasn't like it was a big surprise. But you know, for the better part of the nine months, it just, for me anyway, it just didn't seem real. I'm sure it was plenty real for my wife, Becky, but for me, it was just kind of out there. But now, here I am in the hospital, and here is, it, it, this is the real thing. I mean, we did not become that day uh, partial parents. We weren't somewhat parents. No, we were in this thing all the way. When I read these accounts in Luke and John, uh, it occurs to me that these two writers are communicating a somewhat similar truth, namely that the birth of Jesus on that first Christmas was a real event. It was not a story. It was not a myth. No, it really happened that he was born. Luke, uh, being a physician, you know, comes at the story as you would expect a physician might. He focuses on the practical realities of the situation. He talks about how they had traveled to Bethlehem. And there was no room in the inn. And the baby was placed in a manger, wrapped in cloths. You know, he is focused on the concrete details, like any doctor, any good doctor would be. John, on the other hand, easily the most theologically minded of all the gospel writers, uh, focuses more on spiritual realities. He reminds us that prior to Christmas, from eternity past, from the very beginning, from before the beginning, the word Jesus had been with the Father, with God. Jesus was God. But then he came to be with us. Previously, Jesus existed in a spiritual uh, experience, a spiritual reality, but now Jesus was undeniably, irrevocably among us in the flesh, a full, breathing, uh, complete human being. Jesus wasn't dabbling in our humanity. He wasn't playing at being a human. No, he actually became a human being in every sense of the word. He identified with us in every way that he possibly could. And thank goodness that he did. Because had he not become a human being, a full human being, we would still be lost in our sins. You see, we human beings have a fundamental problem in our lives. Namely, we are sinners. That is to say, at some point in time, each and every one of us, every person who has ever lived, has essentially said to God, no thank you, not interested in you or your plan, I'm going to live my own life, and thereby separated ourselves from God, the source of all life. And we put ourselves on a path, a path that we could not change toward eternal death. And on top of all of that, we do not have the slightest ability to do anything about it. There is nothing that we can do to compensate for our transgression against a holy God. We cannot earn his favor. We cannot earn his love. We cannot earn our salvation. But Jesus, in that decision, on that very first Christmas, to come and take on human flesh, grew up. To become like us in every single way save one, 
He lived a perfectly sinless life. And because Jesus accomplished something that we never could, he never once transgressed against a holy God, he was then able to talk to God and take our place, to pay the price for us, to compensate what we could never compensate, to provide for us a sacrifice that would never be good enough on our own. He took our place on the cross. And God accepted that sacrifice on our behalf. And he validated his acceptance of that sacrifice three days later when he raised Jesus from the dead. And from that day forward, any person who so desires can step into a full, life-changing, destiny-altering relationship with God, all because Jesus chose to come in the flesh and do for us what we could not do for ourselves. Advent, as I mentioned, is historically a time to reflect on that very truth. That Jesus, who was under no compulsion to come whatsoever, not obligated in the least, of his own free will chose to leave the glory of heaven to come and dwell among us, to be born in the most humble of circumstances and to grow up and live a life that would culminate with suffering and torturing and death beyond imagination. Advent is a time for us to think about that and let that reflection begin to impact our lives. You know, these biblical truths, these theological truths that we lift up on Sunday mornings, they aren't just good things to know. They are supposed to find their way into our hearts and begin to impact who we are and how we choose to live our lives and how we relate to other people out in the world. And the fact that Jesus came in the flesh is a fundamental truth of the Christian faith and it should make a powerful impact in our lives as we think about it. As I have spent time in this Advent season thinking about that truth for myself, I'll tell you the recurring response I feel welling up within my soul and that is a response of Gratitude, gratitude, being ever so grateful that Jesus did in fact come for me, that he did pay a price I could not pay, that he gave his all. Not a little bit, he gave his all for me. And if he was willing to give his all for me, can I possibly give him any less in return? I don't think so. I don't think so. Jesus doesn't grab us by the nape of the neck and demand it. No, he gives us his love freely and he waits to see what our response will be. But I think if we spend any appreciable amount of time with the truth of the incarnation, with the truth of Christmas, we cannot help but begin to feel that sense of gratitude, that sense if he gave his all for me, surely I can give my all for him. Now, if you've been in church for any length of time, if you've been a believer for a while, I'm not saying anything new. I'm not talking about something you have never heard about before. It's actually a pretty common theme in church to talk about giving our all for Jesus, about being completely and fully surrendered to his lordship to being submitted to him as our king. That is nothing new. But here's something that I think might be a little new. Taking time to think about what does that really mean? What does it really mean on a day-to-day -day basis? I mean, it's one thing to sit in church and say, oh yeah, Jesus is Lord and I am surrendered to him all the way. But when we leave this place and we get out in the world at school and work and wherever else we go, what does it mean? mean for our lives? Well, in a full, final, ultimate sense, it means that one day we will be completely His. Every single aspect of our being, physical, spiritual, emotional, everything about us will one day be completely surrendered to Jesus. But that's not going to happen until we stand in his presence. That doesn't happen until we die. What about in the meantime? 
What about the days of our lives where we are dealing with people that are sinful, where we are dealing with fearful situations, where we face an uncertain future, where we have challenges in our lives. What does it mean? I want to talk about that some this morning, about what it means on a day-to-day basis to be completely and fully surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And the starting place really is very, very simple. It is a fundamental decision that that is what I want to do. You know, nobody ever became a fully surrendered disciple by accident. Nobody just sort of trips and falls into being a disciple of Jesus Christ. No, it starts with a decision of the will, intentionality, coming to a place of deciding I'm not interested in what the world has to offer. I'm not interested in another way of life. I have made up my mind. I am going to pursue this life. And out of that first decision, out of that intentional movement of the will, our behavior, our thinking, our relationships, everything about us begins to change. It begins to be conformed to the image of Jesus. We begin to live our lives as Jesus would live because we are choosing to follow him instead of following someone else or something else. And that means we have to look at the various areas of our life and see how well are they conforming? To what degree are they changing? Where are we growing? Where are we not growing? Now, we could preach from now until kingdom come about the different aspects of the human experience that need to be surrendered to Jesus, but we're not going to do that. Instead, I want to talk about three specific areas. And the reason I have chosen these three areas to address is because Scripture addresses them frequently. These, you might think of these three areas of the human experience as cutting a very broad swath through our lives. These aren't little, you know, bunny trails. No, these, these three areas I'm going to talk about are a major part of the human experience, what it means to live as a human being. And Scripture addresses them directly. I want to talk about how we address those three areas in such a way that we do reach the goal of being fully, finally, ultimately surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus. And the first of those areas is time. Time. How do you spend your time? Is your time spent primarily uh, pursuing your plans, your desires, doing things that you want to do, setting your own priorities, or have you come to a place in your life, in your spiritual growth, where you have decided, you have learned, my time is not my own. It is a gift. It has been given to me. And I am going to use it for the purposes of the giver. I'm going to learn why he put me on this planet. Did you know you were born with a purpose? You're not here by accident. No, God has a plan for your life. And his desire is that we seek out and learn and live out that plan. And a person who is actively moving toward 100% submission to the Lordship of Jesus Christ is a person who is looking at their time and deciding how it can be best be used for God. One way that we can measure how well we're doing, a very good measure, I think, of how we're using our time is taking stock of how much time we use to serve other people. How much time of our lives is spent serving other people? Well, Dan, why do you choose that as a measure? Very simple. When I look at the life of Jesus, when I look at the way Jesus chose to live, as revealed here in Scripture, do you know what he spent the vast majority of his time doing? It wasn't looking after Jesus. It was serving other people. That was the single highest priority in his life. He said of himself, the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. That's an interesting statement. Give his life as a ransom for many. 
You can look at it in two different ways. In one sense, we look at it as he gave his life dying for us, purchased us. The ransom came through his death, but he also gave his life in the sense of living it every day for us and for those whom he encountered. Everything about Jesus was focused on serving other people. And if we're going to become like Jesus, we have to stop at some point in time and ask ourselves, how much of my time is spent serving other people? Now, if I were a betting man, I would bet that right about now, some of you are thinking something like, you know, that's a good thought, but listen up, I'm a busy person. Busy, I've, you know, I've got an important job and I've got a family and I've got this and I've got that. And, you know, the last thing that I need is the preacher laying on top of me one more thing that I need to do. Well, you came on the wrong day. <laughs> because I'm not budging on this one. And neither is Jesus. Jesus calls us to be servants of others. And, and here's the important thing to keep in mind. You know, I, I'm not issuing a call for anyone to become a monk or a nun. I understand that you've got responsibilities. God understands that you've got responsibilities. But those do not exclude us from the responsibility of serving others. I mean, if we really think about it, we could actually incorporate service into those things that we're already doing. But even beyond the normal course of the day, there are opportunities to serve. And here's a principle I want you to keep in mind all the way through the message. I'm going to come back to it again and again. God can do a lot with just a little. It's amazing how much God can do with just a little bit. No matter what we offer him, he can do amazing things with it. And if you stop and think about it, I mean, relatively speaking, have any of us ever given anything to God that was more than just a little? Do I honestly have something to offer the God of the universe that he's going to step back and say, wow, that's a lot? I don't think so. But God can take whatever we offer him and use it for his purposes and multiply it in ways we never imagined. I know a faith bridger who about five, six years ago decided she was going to give some time to serving others. Really, just a little, relatively speaking. She decided that she was going to be a part of our mentoring ministry through Bridging for Tomorrow. And she was assigned to Niche Elementary. One hour a week, travel to Niche Elementary to mentor a student. As it turned out, she got a twofer, two sisters, that she began to meet with on a weekly basis, one hour a week. She learned that these girls came from a, a, a difficult home, putting it mildly, and that meeting with her for an hour a week was the high point of their week. To sit across the table from an adult who loved them and was interested in them and listened to them and cared about them, huge in their lives. And she journeyed with them right through their elementary school years. And then when they moved on to intermediate school, this individual became our very first mentor at the intermediate level. We'd only ever had mentors in elementary school. Now she's our first intermediate school mentor. She walks with them through those perilous years. God bless her. And then she became our very first high school mentor, journeying with them all the way. And I heard firsthand a couple of months ago about the impact she's making in their lives. Every fall, our Bridging for Tomorrow ministry puts on a banquet for uh, the client ISD just, just to say thank you for what uh, they do in our community and for allowing us to be a part of what they're doing, to serve them through our nonprofit ministry. And at one point in that banquet, um, principal stood up and began to talk about this mentoring relationship and began to talk about the impact it had made in these girls' lives and essentially said, you know, I've seen a lot of young people come through these doors and I've seen a lot of them fail. 
But because of the time that was given to these two little girls, they are now on a trajectory toward a life that they could have never dreamed of a few years ago. They're going to be able to bypass what so many other students can't. Dropping out, teenage pregnancy, gang activity, drug use. One hour a week has made all the difference in the world in the lives of two human beings. Who knows? Who knows what those two girls will go on and do in the lives of other people because one faith bridger gave up one hour a week for their good. God can do a lot with just a little. What does your calendar look like when it comes to serving others? Time is one area, one area that reveals how serious we are about our discipleship. And a second one is money, money. By the way, was that not a fantastic report that Pastor Ken gave us just a little bit ago? I mean, I was so encouraged to hear how many folks are stepping up for the first time, how faith bridgers are coming together as we do to make a difference. I was very encouraged by that. So why is money an indicator of our growth or lack thereof? Well, I'll tell you why. Jesus understood that there are few things in life, few things in the whole wide world, that have the unique ability to take a hold of and own our hearts like money. Very few things can do that like money can. That's why he said, you know, wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart will be also. But he also went on to say that we can't serve two masters. We can't serve money and God. We're going to have to choose between the two. He did not say money is bad. He did not say give away all of your money. He did not say become a pauper. No, he said wake up, realize, understand. We're talking serious business here. There's a very real possibility that you will no longer have money, but money will have you. So what's it going to be? Money's a good indicator, and here's a little test. A little test you can give yourself about uh, to what degree money is being surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus. Let's just suppose that tomorrow uh, a CPA, Certified Public Accountant, were to show up at your house, and his assignment was to do a complete audit of your financial portfolio. Every, everything about your finances was going to come under the scrutiny of his audit. Now, let's also suppose that this CPA knows absolutely nothing about you. Doesn't even know your name, your family, your job, where you go to church, your religious leanings, nothing. The only thing the CPA will know about you is what he or she sees right there in the books, black and white. By the time that accountant was finished with your financial picture, would he or she have any reason whatsoever to believe that you are being fully surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus? Would there be any evidence there at all that Jesus is the most important person in your life? Or would he see lots and lots of other evidence for other things. God can do a lot with just a little. Remember the story of the fishes and the loaves? One day Jesus is preaching to a crowd of about 5,000 people and uh, gets to be lunchtime. Folks are hungry. There is no Chick-fil-A. He asked the disciples, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? What do you mean? Little boy stands up and says, hey, I've got a basket. Five loaves, two fish. What do you think? Jesus said, let's pray. He prayed over it and he blessed it and he fed all 5,000 and there were 12 basketfuls left. That's what I call multiplication. Jesus can do a lot with a little. One of the best parts of my job, the very best parts of my job, is that I get to hear all kinds of stories about what God is doing in and through the generosity of faith bridgers. Stories come through on a regular basis. Heard one of my favorites just here recently. It was one year ago, exactly. 
that a mom came to Faith Bridge with her special needs child. And she was in heaven because this was the first church that she had found that had a ministry for special needs individuals. She couldn't believe that she had found a church that actually made room at the table for someone like her child. She was so blessed by that, so happy to be here. Well, what nobody knew about her, and of course she did not announce this out loud, but what nobody knew about her was that behind the scenes her life was unraveling bit by bit because her husband had decided that he was done, not interested in being a husband and not interested in being a father to this child anymore. And so he left and she's all on her own. Single mom, single caregiver in a very challenging situation. She did her best, treading waters, trying to stay afloat, but finally it reached a day where it just couldn't anymore. Talking to one of our staff members here at church just burst into tears and said, I can't hold it back anymore. I got to tell somebody we are drowning. I don't think we're going to make it. Staff member said, I'm so glad you told me. You should have told me a long time ago. Wheels started turning. Things started happening. We've got a ministry here called Helping Hands, funded by Faith Bridgers. It's made up of Faith Bridgers who move into situations like this and do for people what they can't do for themselves. One of the unfortunate outcomes of this divorce was that she had to change locations. She, by no stretch, had the wherewithal to move somewhere else. Not the time, not the resources, and certainly not the strength. These helping hands folks came in and made it happen. Shortly after that, a ladies grow group in our church heard about what was going on, and they showed up at her new place and said, look, we've heard about your situation. We appreciate a well-decorated home. We know how much it means to a woman to have that, so we want to give that to you. And they pulled their resources and their talents, and they gave this woman a beautiful, lovely place to live And they have remained in touch with her, helping her grow in her faith, helping her become the woman that God created and is calling her to be. Stories like that come across my desk all the time. Now, how did that happen? Well, primarily, of course, because God wanted it to happen. But there's also a human side to the equation It's a great lesson to be learned about the incarnation, by the way. There's always a human part to the equation. People, flesh and blood people, looked up from their own situation and saw someone that had a need, and they did something about it. They gave of their time, and they gave of their money. My job, my primary job here at Faith Bridge, is to serve you by uncovering, by discovering, serve opportunities in our community. So that when you are ready to give of your time and you are ready to give of your money, you don't have to do all sorts of gymnastics to find out what's going on and how are we going to do it and where can we go do it. No, my job is to make the on-ramps as easy as possible. Today, as you leave you're going to discover in both atriums, east and west, and in the woodlands, in the gathering area up there, we have got representatives from our entire bridging ministry, our nonprofit, our local, and our overseas, the road. And I hope as you leave today, if you are not currently involved in serving, you will stop and find out, what can I do? Where can I serve? Where can I be a blessing? We're growing in our relationship with Jesus and we're becoming more and more like him as we understand that our time is not our own, our money is not our own. And third, when we develop what I like to call our love quotient, our love quotient, simply put, that is the capacity that we have to genuinely love other people. Genuinely love them. Now, I know as well as anyone, this command to love can be rather vague. I mean, it's clear, Jesus said, by this, all men will know that you're my disciples, that you love one another. He didn't equivocate on that. 
it's to be the hallmark of a Christian, a, a defining mark of being a Christian. But what does it mean exactly? We use the word love for all kinds of things. We love sports teams. We love ice cream. We love our wives. What do you mean, Jesus, to love? Well, I think it means at least two things. Number one, it has to do with our worldview, our attitude toward other people. An attitude that says, you know what? My love for you is unconditional. The only thing I'm concerned with is whether or not you are a human being created in the image of God. I don't care about your race. I don't care about your gender. I don't care about your socioeconomic status. I don't care about your sexual orientation. I don't care about your political leanings. I don't care about your disabilities. The only thing I care about is that you are a human being created in the image of God. And therefore, you are worthy of my love, just as I was worthy of unconditional love from the first missionary who came looking for me. It's a worldview, but it's also, secondly, a pattern of behavior, a recognizable pattern of behavior that says to the world, you know what? It's not all about me. I am not the center of the universe. I am an outwardly focused person, and I am going to put your needs and your concerns ahead of my own. No longer will I be first. Now, I, I, I doubt I would get a whole lot of pushback from that description of love. Most Christian people, I think, would nod in agreement to that. And, and I think most Christians generally consider themselves to be loving people. We give ourselves a pretty good grade. I mean, maybe we're not Mother Teresa, but by and large, you know, we're, we're loving people. Well, here's the deal. Uh, we're not. We're really not. And the reason I know that is because the Bible says that we are sinners and the essence of sin is selfishness. That's what it means to be a sinner, to be selfish. And it's something that we battle every single day of our lives in every context in which we live. So how do we love? Well, remember, <laughs> Jesus can do a lot with just a little. He's Really, he never called anybody to be Mother Teresa except Mother Teresa. He wants you to love as he made you to love. He can do a lot with just a little, even when it comes to love. I learned this with crystal clarity my first year out of seminary. Back in 1992, I was appointed to a, a large suburban church just outside of Atlanta, Georgia. And one of my various responsibilities was to lead a group, a ministry, uh, to do ministry at a local nursing home. Looking back on it, 24 years later, I can see very, very clearly that there was no love in my heart. If you'd asked me at the time, I would have absolutely believed and said that there was. I mean, after all, I'm Pastor Dan. I'm ordained. This is what I do. I love for a living. <laughs> Looking back on it, though, there were some telltale signs that it wasn't love. The first one that I failed to see was just the general feeling I had um, that could only be described as irked that I had to do this in the first place. I mean, that's not what I went to seminary for. You know, I, I want to preach. I want to lead. I want to... I want to do fun things, but this is what they're paying me to do, so this is what I'll do. So I went to the church and met the group there, and we got in the church van, and the second thing that I could not see about myself that revealed clearly no love in my heart were the thoughts going through my mind as we drove to the nursing home, thoughts of dread. I'm thinking about how these facilities, you know, are just permeated with the smell of urine. I'm thinking about how difficult communication is, either because of dementia or a stroke. And I'm thinking about just the, the pall of sadness that tends to abide over those places. You know, I'm just, well, we finally get there. And this inner attitude of mine begins to reveal itself outwardly 
as I walk through that nursing home. You, you, you could only describe my ministry there that night as stiff, as I just sort of carefully moved from you know, person to person, not really making contact, just sort of you know, being there. But after about 15 minutes or so, the Lord had had enough of that. And he took me by the chin and he said, I want you to look at something right over here. And he pointed my vision vision in the direction of Margaret. Margaret was one of our team members. There was nothing stiff at all about Margaret. I looked over there and there's Margaret. And she's on her knees in front of this lady in a wheelchair. And she's holding her hands. She's looking in her eyes. She's talking to her. And this lady can't talk back, but that doesn't matter. She's not there for conversation. She's there to love. There's not a doubt in my mind that whatever that lady's mental condition was, when that evening was over, she knew she was loved because Margaret showed her the love of Jesus. As I was driving home that night, Jesus essentially said to me, so you, you, you didn't want to get near those people, huh? You don't want to smell those smells. You didn't want to have to touch them. You don't have to talk to them. It's kind of repulsive, wasn't it? Well, guess what? So were you. And I came for you. I died for you. Can't you give them just a little love? You won't find the word proactive anywhere in the Bible. Hebrews didn't use it. The Greeks didn't use it. But I can't think of a better word to describe Jesus. He didn't wait for us to ask him to come. He looked down and he saw our situation and he chose to come. And you know what he gave us? He gave us his time and he gave us his resources and he gave us his love. And he still does that to this day. Whatever else you do during this Advent season, I want to challenge you to set aside some time and think to yourself, am I coming more and more like Jesus? Is my time, my resources, my love, do they demonstrate that I want to be His all the way? Let's pray. Lord, we confess to you that we fall far, far short of who you would have us to be. Thank you for not giving up on us. Give us grace, O oh God, to offer you what we have, even if it's just a little. And give us the pleasure of watching you multiply that to bless other people and to change us. We offer our prayer in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hello and welcome to Postscript. My name is Adam McIntyre and I'm joined today by Pastor Dan Slagle who just finished his sermon called The First Missionary. Dan, thank you so much for being here with us today. You bet. So the first question we have is in your sermon you mentioned a lot of different ways in which um, we can kind of go through the process of sanctification. Mm -hmm. You you talked about how um, we could be more generous generous with our time, our money, learning how to love people better. Right. that can be overwhelming maybe for some people sure. who maybe haven't got started on any of those things. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about the process of sanctification, what that looks like? Yeah, um, th- that is overwhelming to a lot of people. There, there is a misconception out there that uh, our growth in Christ should be up and to the right in a straight right. line, but it never happens that way for anybody. Sure. Uh, for one thing, there are just a multiplicity of areas in our life that need to be surrendered to Jesus. And we're only able to work on, you know, a handful at a time. So 
you know, uh, maybe our, our marriage has made it this far, but our thought life is only this far. Right. And maybe our work habits are this far, you know. So I would hate for somebody to walk away from this message feeling as though, oh my gosh, you know, this is way too much for me. I could never, God can do a lot with a little. Right. And he has a way of bringing to our attention the area that he wants to work on right now. Right sort of the most pressing issue. Yeah. A danger there, if I might, may digress a bit, is often we get bored. Right. We get tired yeah. and we want to, but you know, I, in my experience, God will keep us kind of right there until sure. you know we're, we're moving along right. and then he moves to other areas. But um, no need for discouragement, right. uh, step at a time, day at a time. Absolutely, and, and you mentioned in your sermon how uh, one of the things that we should be focused on is just being proactive mm -hmm. in following Jesus. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Yeah. Uh, I, it may be symptomatic of our culture at large, um, but I think uh, it's also very symptom symptomatic of our sinful state. You know, Christians can be very lazy, yeah. especially with regard to, to spiritual growth. Sure. We, we just want it to happen. Right. Well, the Bible is clear that you know, God is always opposed to earning. We can never earn His love. Right. It's free. It's a gift of grace. Right. But God is never opposed to effort. Sure. He, he expects us to work. You know, work out your salvation. Yeah. Not, we're not working for our salvation. We have received it, and the response is to work as hard as we can in the areas that need work. And so there has to come a point where we decide on a macro scale, yes, I'm going to do this, and then on a micro scale, the individual areas, we've got to proactively go after them with a great deal of intentionality right. and uh, do what needs to be done. Absolutely. And so don't become overwhelmed at all of the areas in which we need to uh, look more like Christ. Yeah. And instead, just be proactive one step at a time. Can you give us some practical ways in which we could be proactive in um, and following Jesus and serving Jesus and serving others. Absolutely. You know, one of the great blessings of Faith Bridge Church is that we have always been an outwardly focused mm -hmm. church. Uh, mission has always been a primary emphasis here. Mm -hmm. And we do it uh, in as many different ways and many different places as a church can. Right. We have our nonprofit, uh, Bridging for Tomorrow, mm -hmm that gives people opportunities to go uh, into some very difficult, poverty-stricken situations mm -hmm. and make a difference. Yeah. We have other local mission opportunities just through our local bridging uh, ministries, uh, working with um, nursing homes, right. among other things. Uh, and then we also have the road, which mm -hmm. is our overseas missions. I think we've got 54 trips plan for 2017. Yeah. So, you know, there's room for everybody. Right. If, if going overseas isn't your cup of tea, plenty of stuff to do right here. Absolutely. All you have to do is get in touch with the bridging office and we will help you find your place. Absolutely. Um, and I kind of want to consider that a challenge for everybody yeah. watching today. If you are not serving yet, uh, get in contact with Bridging for Tomorrow, either through the website or you can talk to them in person on a Sunday morning and then consider joining the road. Um, it's, it's really is an incredible opportunity. Uh, if you don't know, if you're kind of shaky about it, uh, I want to encourage you to come on January 4th to Missions Kickoff. Right. You get a better sense of what it's all about. Uh, Pastor Dan, thank you so much for yep. joining us today. And thank you all for joining us. We will see you all next week. Thanks for joining us for PostScript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.